Well, it's a great honor and privilege to be able to speak with you today. I want to thank uh, Bob and Mary Ann Waman for inviting me and for pulling this together as an in-person <laughs> conference right on the heels of a huge uh, COVID pandemic. And uh, also wanted to thank all the previous speakers that uh, I hope I'll be building on. We just heard some wonderful talks from Dr. Mohammed and, 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 and Dr. Vijay Varia, and uh, as well as the talks yesterday and ones to come. As you could, um, okay. Um, I'm a, a medical oncologist, a neuroendocrine oncologist. For many, many years, my entire practice has been neuroendocrine oncology. When I first started the field, there was not one single drug approved in the United States for treating neuroendocrine cancer. Now we have three. We have a lot more that are on the way. And every single thing that we have is based on a clinical trial. So you've heard a lot of things about clinical trials from, I think, every speaker who's, who's talked so far. I'm going to try to put this into perspective, talking about the treatments that we have that are really the results of clinical trials that have led to the approvals, ones that are high-profile phase three trials that are um, hopefully going to lead to new drugs on the market in the very near future and are going to completely change the course of clinical practice and patient care. And then, uh, in addition, you'll be hearing a lot more about the nature of what clinical trials are, what is phase one, two, three, four, what are the advantages of being on a trial. All of that will be coming in a, in a talk you'll be hearing this afternoon, and you'll be hearing more talks about clinical trials from other speakers. So um, as you can see, I'm the director of the Center for Carcinoid and Neuroendocrine Tumors at Mount Sinai. This is um, a huge uh, program for treating neuroendocrine cancer, and we have a, a, a multidisciplinary program. The last 10 years have revolutionized the treatment of neuroendocrine cancer. We have had these trials, as you could see, seven trials that are randomized phase three trials that were strongly positive results led to FDA approval of treatments, and all of this happened since 2011. So really, it's only been in the last decade, in the last 11 years, that we've had everything approved. Streptozosin, which you see back in the 80s for pancreatic neuroendocrine cancer, is hardly ever used today. It has a lot of GI toxicity, kidney toxicity, and it's just not used much. It's cumbersome. And the modern era really began very, very recently. We'll be talking about all of these things that have gotten approved again and things that are on the way. Somatostatin is a natural hormone. It's nature's turn off to the endocrine system, turns off production of hormones, turns off growth of neuroendocrine cells, and it turns out the natural hormone only lasts for a couple of minutes before it's gone. You eat a candy bar, you get extra insulin to help uh, deal with it, and then you don't want your blood sugar just to keep going down to zero. You want your blood sugar just to go down to normal. And then somatostatin comes along, shuts off the insulin, and then it does its job and it's gone. So we need something that's long acting for treating cancer, and these are called somatostatin analogs. And as you've heard, we have octreotide and lanreotide. Um, slide advancer is a little bit tricky to get used to here. Okay. There were two studies with somatostatin analogs, but only one is a phase three randomized trial that led to FDA approval of the drug. The first trial, which you heard about a little earlier, the PROMID trial, was a single institution trial in Germany. It was uh, stopped prematurely. It was done with a small number of patients. The results are incomprehensible with um, the people treated having a time to cancer progression that was shorter than the placebo people treated on the lanreotide trial. If you got a placebo on the trial I'm showing you here, lanreotide versus placebo, the placebo people had an 18-month period of cancer control without any treatment at all. And in the PROMID trial of octreotide, the people that got octreotide had control that lasted 14 months, which they thought was very exciting compared to seven months in a control. But as far as I'm concerned, the results are completely incomprehensible. So that's why the FDA never approved octreotide to this day, except as a treatment for diarrhea and flushing. But as you've heard, it's widely used anyway as an anti-cancer drug, but we really are still struggling to find data and probably will never exist because I don't think anyone's going to do that trial again. Okay, so this is the so-called clarinet trial. You could see from the letters in yellow 
how it was possible to invent the word clarinet out of this title. It's, real, it's a bit uh, convoluted. But anyway, this is known as the clarinet trial. At the time, there was not a single treatment that was shown to be effective in treating neuroendocrine cancer, so it was felt to be perfectly ethical to randomize people against a placebo. And in addition, everybody who was randomized against placebo was immediately offered the opportunity of ha having active lanreotide if the cancer progressed. So really, everybody who went on the trial could be treated with lanreotide, but this was the initial phase of the trial was the randomization. So the results were very impressive. I know you've seen lots of different graphs and things. I'm going to just try to put the data in a, in a straightforward, comprehensible fashion so you can see how good it really is. This is the update of the original data. The, at the time the public paper was first published, we didn't know how long it worked because the people getting lanreotide were doing so well. They just said uh, median progression-free survival not reached. We now know from this uh, update of that trial that in the people with gastrointestinal neuroendocrine tumors, like carcinoid tumors, the average person went for over five years before the cancer progressed. That's remarkable, and this is an average of averaging two or three months in some people to 15 years in other people, and you average it all together, you get 61 and a half months. Doesn't tell you how you're gonna do as an individual person, but it tells you this is incredibly good results with a treatment with um, incredibly few side effects compared to many other cancer treatments we have, okay? So as I mentioned earlier, placebo, 18 months versus 61 and a half months in the treated people. Pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors as a group did a little bit worse, 30 months of cancer control versus 12 months in the placebo group. However, this is a very heterogeneous group and there are people with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors whose results are just as good as people with carcinoids. There are other people who the tumors didn't respond. I should also mention that all of these patients were chosen based on a molecular target, which is the somatostatin receptor. At the time this trial was done, octreotide scanning, um, octrea scan was all that was available. Of course, today we would use gallium dotatate or copper 64 as a predictive marker for success. It's an even better, much better marker for success, and the results would probably be even better today because the patients would be so carefully selected. The goal of all of our treatments is to have the right treatment for the right patient at the right time. That's what everybody is talking about today. That's the nature of targeted therapy with proper targets. Okay, now in addition to the shots in the rear, which you're familiar with, and we could talk about more in the question and answer session, I'm happy to talk about any of these things, I wanted to mention a new development which is alternatives to shots in the behind every four weeks. One is oral drugs, okay? There are two oral drugs that are um, going to be possible, I think, in the near future. One is paltucetine, which is a um, oral small molecule somatostatin receptor type two agonist. That means it's a drug which sticks to the somatostatin receptor, works exactly like octreotide or lanreotide, okay? And it works in acromegaly, which is a kind of pituitary tumor. Trials are being started in carcinoid tumors, and we're gonna see how that is going to pan out. I think that hopefully it's going to be as good in these tumors as it is in pituitary tumors, which respond to the same treatments in the same way. And if that's the case, it's going to lead to potentially a dramatic improvement in quality of life for our patients. Okay, and these are the criteria that will be um, necessary to go on the trial. And uh, it's going to be initially for people with carcinoid syndrome, but hopefully when it, uh, this study is done, it will be expanded to other people. It makes for more quick, um, Approval, let's say, when you have a, an endpoint which you can reach right away. Is diarrhea getting better? You'll find out very fast. Whereas for cancer control of people that don't have any syndrome, you have to wait for many, 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 many years to see how long it might be before somebody's cancer progresses. And you can see with the Lanreotide trial, the average was more than five years, and it would cause a bigger delay to potentially um, get the drug 
on the market. So I think that's part of the motivation for starting with carcinoid syndrome. But just stay tuned because I think there's light at the end of the tunnel for people with the need for shots every time. The second oral pill, which is very exciting, is called Micapsa. Okay, now this is another approach to delivering oral somatostatin um, analogs, and this is a octreotide formulation. It actually uses octreotide that's mixed in with an oily material that is in a pill. You take the pill and it very transiently makes wider spaces between the cells in the intestine, which lets this um, octreotide go right through into the bloodstream, and immediately those wider spaces go back to normal size spaces. And it's been used in normal volunteers, and it's very safe, and it's been already studied in acromegaly and the pituitary tumor, and it's been so effective in acromegaly that the FDA approved it in acromegaly, and we're hoping that it's going to be just as good in neuroendocrine cancers because at the end of the day, the thing that makes all the difference is having the proper blood level of octreotide. And whether you do it by subcutaneous injections three times a day or octreotide LAR every four weeks, the important thing is getting the appropriate blood level, and this medication seems to have that capability. So stay tuned. I think this is another drug and whether the first one to be approved is going to be my capsule or be the um, paltucetine, we don't know, but I think that these are both very exciting. And I'm trying to um, share with you the flavor of the excitement of phase three trials, which are being um, offered with something new that's potentially better compared with best standard of care. So if you don't get the drug and you get lanreotide, you're still not getting anything worse than you would be getting otherwise. But half of the people on the trial get this drug up front, and if people progress, then there's the opportunity to switch over and people can have the other drug uh, later on. So I think that trial participation is uh, potentially excellent. If we didn't have people participating in the clarinet trial, we wouldn't have lanreotide on the market today. And if we didn't have people participating in the PROMID trial earlier on, we wouldn't have people getting octreotide today. So I think that we just have to realize everything we have is based on clinical trial results. Now, there's another approach which I think is also extremely exciting, and this is a subcutaneous injection. Now, some of you are familiar with subcutaneous injections of octreotide acetate, which is an injection you can give yourself a couple of times a day to improve control of carcinoid syndrome. And I know Dr. Muhammad was mentioning that in his carcinoid syndrome talk, that that's one of the things we have to improve carcinoid syndrome is just more somatostatin analog in the body. And that's something that is common. But this is something really special because CAM 2029 is a form of octreotide injection where you just give a simple injection with a tiny little insulin needle like you do for subcutaneous octreotide acetate three times a day. But the difference is this isn't three times a day. This is once every week or two. So it's a long-acting injection with a, a very easy-to-inject, watery, thin material with a teeny needle. What's unique about CAM 2029 is the moment it gets injected as a simple subcutaneous injection with a teeny weeny needle is it immediately forms a little gel under the skin and that gel will sustain release over a long period of time. So you, it starts out as a thin, easily injectable liquid through a teeny needle and then once it's injected, it gels up and then becomes a sustained release. So that's the idea. So this is a trial comparing octreotide LAR um, well, you can see the differences between the two. So octreotide LAR has octreotide with microspheres of a material to allow for the octreotide to release slowly over a month, and it re results in rather variable levels of blood levels throughout the month, with the highest levels being soon after the injection and low levels before the next injection. And it's a deep intramuscular injection. Any of you who have had octreotide LAR know it's not a, a real fun experience. The CAM 2029 is the octreotide formulated with this fluid crystal technology in this liquid solution, which is self-injected with a tiny needle using an auto-injector where you could just, you know, 
boom, get it in without having to do anything very scary to do the injection. It absorbs body fluid right away, making this viscous liquid crystal gel, and it results in it sort of being encapsulated at the place where it's injected and slowly releasing it over weeks. It's also stable at room temperature, unlike octreotide, and even if you're traveling with this material, you can just uh, bring it at room temperature. Another remarkable thing about CAM 2029 is the blood levels are 500% higher than octreotide LAR. So it's possible to give much higher amounts of octreotide LAR, not LAR, but octreotide, safely and potentially with greater anti-cancer effect. So this is also something extremely exciting, and a lower dose of this CAM 2029 will give higher blood levels than a high dose of octreotide LAR. Octreotide LAR is also limited by the fact you have only two cheeks in your buttocks, and you can't give more than 30 milligrams in a single shot because it would be way too much. So the maximum in a normal dose is 30 milligrams, and if you want to go past recommended doses and into the stratosphere, that would be 30 milligrams on each side, but you can't go more than that. But here with a teeny weeny injection, you can actually get 500% um, increased blood levels with, uh, with this, and there's really no limit to how high you can go when you have an injection that's so easy. So this randomized trial is going to be a phase three randomized trial. It's going to be available throughout the country at selected sites. It's uh, going to be given every two weeks where half the people get lanreotide or octreotide, standard of care. The other half of people get this medication. Everybody is offered CAM 2029 if cancer progresses, so that um, it's a little bit like um, the design of the lanreotide trial I told you about in the beginning. It's for well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors of gastrointestinal or pancreatic origin, stable neuroendocrine tumor markers, positive somatostatin receptor imaging on gallium dotate or copper 64 dotate imaging. So stay tuned. I think all three of these are exciting alternative uh, phase three trials. And like I mentioned in the beginning, there are lots and lots and lots of clinical trials that I'm not going to be talking about today that are in phase one or phase two with all types of new agents with immunotherapies and uh, oncolytic viruses, new molecules of all sorts. But what I'm talking about today are things that are really ready for prime time for phase three clinical trials that, if positive, would lead pretty rapidly, I think, to an FDA approval of these agents. Okay. Now, the next thing I wanted to talk about is using the somatostatin receptor on the cell, which you've heard a lot about, as a molecular target. So what you see there in green target is the somatostatin receptor, which sits on the neuroendocrine cell. When you see the word ligand, ligand is something which sticks to the somatostatin receptor, and the ligand, in the case of all of the molecules you've been hearing about for PRRT and for molecular imaging, all end in tate. Did you notice that? Dotatate, gallium-68 dotatate, lutetium-177 dotatate. The key is tate. What is tate? Tate means octreotate. It's the same thing like octreotide. It's a somatostatin analog, okay? So that's the part that is the ligand. That's what sticks to the cancer cell. Attached to that is what is labeled linker or chelator. This is something which holds a radioactive isotope very tightly. So what happens is DOTA, which is a, a name for a big, long chemical name of a chelator, is attached to the somatostatin analog. So you take the DOTA tape, you attach, sorry, you take the tate, the octreotate, and you attach dota. You have dota octreotate, and then in that dota, you could put in either what's described as a reporting agent, copper 64, gallium 68, whatever you like, to make a scan. That shoots out um, rays which make beautiful images, as you saw um, many pictures of yesterday, okay? And if that is positive, you then can use that same chelator, the DOTA, and put in a therapy agent like lutetium-177. You could put in, you know, lead isotopes. You could put in all kinds of isotopes in this chelator. And then when you inject it intravenously, 
right away, it goes through the blood and immediately sticks to the uh, somatostatin receptor. So it sticks to the same thing. And remember, it's the tate, the atrio tate that does the sticking. And that brings the whole works into the cell because it all gets internalized in the cell and it gets stuck. And then rays get shot out that either make pictures or kill the cancer. So that's the principle of theranostics, which the word you first heard yesterday, therapy and diagnosis with the same molecule. In this case, the same molecule being dotatate. And it's only what you attach to that that you could use for therapy or for diagnosis, okay? And it's all based on that same somatostatin receptor that we use with um, octreotide, lanreotide, and these new um, substitutes, if you like, for octreotide and lanreotide, okay? So that's the uh, basis of this. And really, all of these treatments are highly targeted therapies, personalized treatments for patients who have somatostatin receptors. We have other things for people who don't have somatostatin receptors, but for sure, you wouldn't want to waste your time having all the side effects of a therapy with no possible benefit if you didn't have somatostatin receptors. And there are patients with neuroendocrine cancers who don't have those receptors. So this shows you a little bit about how it works when you inject lutetium-177 intravenously. In the first panel on the left, the lutetium dotatate concentrates very quickly in the neuroendocrine tumors by sticking to the somatostatin receptors. Okay, it gets internalized into the cell. It then starts shooting out rays, which damage the DNA and cause cells to die. That's the principle of this. And we'll talk a little bit more about it. The Netter-1 trial, which I was uh, very much involved with from the beginning, is a, a randomized trial using lutetium-177 dotatate. Lutetium-177 shoots out what's called a beta the kind of a, a radiation that gets shot out from lutetium-177. And this particular be, uh, beta radiation travels two millimeters, maybe a sixteenth of an inch, before it's completely absorbed. So this very, very little collateral damage. You can nuke all the tumors in the body in one shot, and the normal tissues don't get significant radiation. Even if you had 20 tumors in your liver, the surrounding liver couldn't get much radiation because the maximum collateral damage is two millimeters, so it's about a sixteenth of an inch, okay? So people were randomly assigned to lutetium-177 dotatate at the time when none of this was approved versus what was felt to be an alternative standard of care, which was to double the dose of octreotide and give 30 milligrams into each buttock. So now you have a 60 milligram doubling the dose of octreotide versus radioactive octreotide. What happened, you saw this slide already, the people that got the gallium-68 dotatate did much, much better. The average person getting the double dose of octreotide had cancer progression after about eight months. The people getting lutetium-177 had cancer which stayed under excellent control for, you know, for years. In addition, as you saw in the carcinoid syndrome talk, that PRT improves carcinoid syndrome, it improves diarrhea, it improves flushing, pain, it improves fatigue, it improves performance status, which means just the ability to uh, function at a high level for people who weren't previously functioning at a high level. And when people were able just to rate their global health score on a scale, they would always say that their health score has dramatically improved. This doesn't happen the next day, it, you know, symptoms can sometimes worsen over the first month, but after a few months go by, people do much, much better when they get treated in general. Okay. Now, what I wanted to tell you is that study was a, a landmark. It kind of revolutionized the treatment of metastatic neuroendocrine tumor. Again, after the previous revolution that happened when somatostatin analogs and everolimus became available. But now we're going to the next level. Again, you're going to hear about so many studies with PRRT. There's a talk coming up soon. PRRT in combination with, ever, with different um, drugs, uh, chemotherapies plus PRRT at the same time, PRRT plus immune therapy, PRRT given intraarterially, PRRT in all different ways. But all of these are early studies. What I'm going to talk to you about now are phase three randomized trials, which are potentially going to lead to uh, fairly rapid 
FDA approval if these trials are positive. And they're all things I think everybody should be aware of because these are things that are um, available now and will be practice changing hopefully in the near future. One is the trial of lutetium-177 dotatate versus standard of care in lung carcinoids. Lung carcinoids are underrepresented on clinical trials for neuroendocrine cancer. Many of the doctors treating neuroendocrine cancer are gastrointestinal oncologists, and most of the trial designs have been gastrointestinal and pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, and lung neuroendocrine tumors have been left a little on the side. So now the, um, there's a, a tendency now to try to think about lung carcinoids and say let's not totally leave them out because they are important and we want to be sure that something is done to uh, include them. So this is a trial using the only drug that's ever been approved to date for lung carcinoid, which is Everolimus, versus PRRT. The PRRT schedule identical to what has been proven already in pancreatic and neuroendocrine cancers, but it's not a, it's been actually proved in uh, intestinal neuroendocrine cancer is what NETR1 was, but it's approved for pancreatic and gastrointestinal tumors. This allows it to be done in lung. PRT can, is done occasionally for lung carcinoids right now, but the problem is it's not an approved use. It's an off-label use, and many, many insurance companies refuse to pay for it, and that's really a challenge because the treatment itself is already proven to be what we call site agnostic. It doesn't matter where the cancer started. As long as you have the molecular marker proving success, which is the dotatate PET, it doesn't matter if it starts in the lung, in the thymus, in the kidney, in the ovary. It doesn't matter. If you have a strongly positive PET, you have the receptor for doing the, the study. But the approval, that is what insurance companies base reimbursement on, it says pancreas and gastrointestinal. So in order to get lung ever approved, a study has to be done, and this is study will hopefully give us the answer. So this is typical carcinoid or atypical carcinoid of the lung, okay? And it could even be people who have never been treated before, which is something new, because the current approval for PRRT is in people who progressed after a somatostatin analog. This is for people who never had anything before to see what happens when you use PRRT right off the bat. There are several studies right now that are starting for that population to see if we actually get better results if we use it right away. So standard PRRT for four cycles, versus Everolimus. Okay. Now, that's in the, in, for lung. In pancreas, this is a study which you saw just a few minutes ago, which is a, um, a landmark study comparing temozolomide versus chemozolomide and capecitabine. This is a randomized phase three trial, really well done. Results are extraordinary. The FDA has still never approved it to this day as a treatment but the results are so overwhelmingly convincing and it's in all the guidelines for therapy that I haven't personally had insurance companies turn it down for anybody. I think it's an excellent treatment for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors and it turns out that certain other neuroendocrine tumors as well. And you saw um, in Nina's talk earlier about the biomarker of MGMT, which can also be another predictive marker for success. But I just want to tell you, this is now the standard best chemotherapy we have for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, with a third of the patients getting the combination, having a major tumor shrinkage. 33% of the patients had, you know, at least a third of the tumor diameters go down when they get treated. So the idea is to compare that with PRRT right off the bat which is very, very interesting. The same concept is with the lung randomized trial, but now this is with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors of PRRT versus capecitabine plus temozolomide, which goes by the nickname of CAPE-TEM. So half of the people get standard PRRT four cycles, the other half get temozolomide and capecitabine, and we see if there's an advantage to using it right off the bat. It doesn't have a crossover to the other arm, but if you're treated up front with capecitabine and temozolomide, you can be treated at time of progression with lutetium um, PRRT because that's already an approved treatment. So that's not, the progression crossover is not really needed in the trial. It's already available. So the question is, which is better? If you progress on lutetium, you can get treated with CAPE-TEM, or if you progress on CAPE-TEM, you can get treated with lutetium PRRT. But the question is, which is better to do first? I think it's a very, very interesting study and something, again, with 
I think, what we call equipoise. It's really, we don't know which of these is better. They're both equally good. Participating in the trial, I think, is highly reasonable. The worst that can happen is that you would get um, PRT, sorry, that you would get the Cape TEM up front, which is what you'd get up front anyway. So it's a very interesting trial. All of these trials, I think, are very, very interesting and have been very carefully vetted to uh, get to the point where they are today. Next thing you'll be hearing a little more about in uh, the talk on uh, PRT trials, but I wanted to emphasize that we have a new type of PRT using alpha particles. An alpha emission is completely different than what is currently used, which is a beta. The lutetium-177 shoots out a beta, which I told you is a, it's basically an electron which travels two millimeters and it causes DNA damage. An alpha particle has two neutrons and two protons. It's maybe a thousand times heavier than the um, electron. It's a high energy particle that goes plowing through the cell like a bull in a china shop. And by the time it gets through the cell, that cell is dead meat. It doesn't have a chance there. The DNA is just torn in half. There's no way it could repair itself. It isn't a single strand break, it's a double strand break. And the other thing about this particular um, energy is that it only travels a couple of cells. So instead of traveling two millimeters, it travels uh, in distances measured in thousandths of a millimeter. So it causes very, very little collateral damage. That's a big advantage of it. A disadvantage is if you have a heterogeneous population and some of the cells don't have an, uh, many somatostatin receptors and don't have the cancer stick to those cells, you could end up with little resistant clusters of cells that aren't getting killed in a crossfire like you do with beta. So we don't have the actual answer yet, but it's looking incredibly promising in clinical trials with huge tumor shrinkages. And I think you've seen some of the uh, pictures uh, in an earlier session. <coughs> there are trials sprouting up all over America using alpha emitters because people are so excited about this new class of PRT. But there are only two clinical trials ready for prime time in the whole United States. If you look up clinicaltrials.gov, <coughs> that website will list every clinical trial that is open in the United States. You'll see there are only two trials of alpha emitters which are approved, open, and going. Others are possibly going to happen in the, in the, in the future. One is a trial using um, radioactive lead, the other using radioactive actinium. So there's a study called RYZ101 compared with standard of care in gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumors that have already been treated with normal PRRT with lutetium-177 dotatate. Okay, so people who already got PRRT for four cycles, okay, mm -hmm. people who already got PRRT for four cycles and the cancer is now growing, it's resistant, okay, so what do you do? There really is no approved additional PRRT in the United States. Some people are using an additional two cycles of PRRT um, using lutetium-177 dotatate, which there's some experience with in Europe and we're doing it in America. <coughs> but this is an opportunity to use PRRT in that population with the alpha emitter drug that potentially can be used with extra safety after previous PRRT because it has such little um, uh, collateral damage outside the tumors because of the short distance the alpha particle is able to travel. So that's one trial, that RYZ101, stay tuned. The other one is a trial which is currently available at limited sites, particularly at um, Excel Diagnostics in Houston, using um, this Alphamedics 02. This is a trial of lead to 112 dotamtate, which is very much like dotatate. Um, in people who have had never had PRRT before. So these two trials are complementary. The second one is for people who never had PRRT. The first one is for people who did have PRRT. And I think they're both extraordinarily interesting and exciting trials. And more clinical trials, as I say, are gonna be coming, but are not open yet. This is the RYZ101 trial, where half the people get the RYZ101 and the other half of people get investigator's choice for advanced gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, whether it's doubling the dose of octreotide or lanreotide, everolimus, sunitinib, investigator's choice. 
Okay, there's still another um, exciting national trial, phase three, with um, PRRT using something very similar to what we now use with lutetium-177 dotatate. This is using lutetium-177 dotatac. So what is the difference between dotatate and dotatac? Dotatate, as I said, is octreotate combined with the isotope. Dotatac is using octreotide combined with the isotope. So the difference between octreotate and octreotide is fairly tiny. But the difference is that this is allowing a population of patients to be treated on a clinical trial, which has really not been explored before in any large trial and potentially can lead to new accruals and new, um, sorry, new um, approvals for PRRT. Okay, this is for people who have aggressive G2, grade two, or grade three well-differentiated gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. It doesn't matter if there's syndrome or no syndrome. You're comparing two active treatment arms. And it's, um, I think, an excellent and very exciting clinical trial that will allow PRRT to be used more commonly in people with these more aggressive tumors where there's a shortage of good information on the best way to treat aggressive neuroendocrine tumors. This is that trial that I was telling you about. Okay. I'm showing you what the Theranostics is all about. I don't want to um, spend much time on this because of our time constraints, but I just wanted to show you this picture from Richard Baum from Germany of a gallium-68 dotatate PET before PRRT was used. The panel on the left you could see the CAT scan shows one tumor, but you see two big tumors on the gallium dotatate. You then treat, and after one cycle, you think you're in a remission, but you still see two big old tumors there on the gallium scan because it's so much more sensitive. After two cycles, you don't see any problem at all. Instead of going for four cycles, this patient stopped after two, and only a year later started coming back. You see it much faster on the gallium dotatate and much more clearly that there's a recurrence. And this is what we call theranostics therapy and diagnosis. You use gallium-68 dotatite for the diagnosis and lutetium-177 dotatate for the therapy. Same um, molecule sticky. Copper-64 dotatate for um, somatostatin receptor imaging is a very exciting new treatment which may have even higher resolution than gallium-68. I'm just going to quickly talk about a couple of other molecular targets over the next few minutes. One is the so-called mTOR inhibitor, Everolimus. The story of mTOR inhibitors is one of the great serendipities in the history of medicine. Somebody went to visit the Easter Islands in the middle of nowhere. It's like a thousand miles from civilization in the Pacific Ocean. And on one of the islands called Rapa Nui Island are these giant heads of ancient warriors they probably weigh 120 tons or something, and they're 100 feet high, made of a solid piece of stone, standing on the grass, where there are no stones anywhere to be seen. Nobody knows how they were uh, erected up there and how they could withstand all the hurricanes and cyclones and whatever happened in the last, you know, 1,000 years, whenever they were made long, long, long time ago. It's one of the wonders of the ancient world. Like the pyramids in Egypt, you know, somehow they were, <laughs> were put up. Okay, this is one of those sort of things. So somebody got this incredible idea that if he, well, he was, I guess, looking at the stones. There's not much else to do in the Easter Islands, but look at these heads, right? He got this idea that if he took some dirt back to America, that maybe he would find an antibiotic that was never found before in this isolated ecosystem. So he took some dirt, and I don't know if they had Ziplocs then, but whatever he had, he brought it back to America in his little container and then put it on a petri dish and plated it and looked for microorganisms. And they found a fungus that had never been discovered before. And it made an antibiotic that had never been discovered before. And this was pretty incredible after people had searched, you know, Africa and China and everywhere in the world and they, for, um, you know, special antibiotics. So he named the antibiotic rapamycin after Rapa Nui Island, where it was found. Well, Rapa Nui Island, rapamycin, it's just natural to do. Okay, so rapamycin turns out that it has the chemical name of serolimus. And when Novartis got a hold of it, they called it everolimus when they made it into a user-friendly pill. 
And that's how we got Everolimus. It's basically an antibiotic. It's an anti-cancer thing. Well, right at that time when this was discovered, the NCI had so much money, it was unbelievable. And they made this great big giant war on cancer. And they made a testing system with cells in a cell culture so that anybody who discovered any organic chemical for any random reason could put it in this testing system to see if the cancer cells dropped dead. And amazingly, cancer cells dropped dead when this was put in the culture system. And now we had an anti-cancer drug. They had no idea how it worked or what it was or what it was doing. And it worked on an enzyme in the cell that had never been discovered. So they gave this enzyme in the cell the name mTOR, which means mammalian target of rapamycin. So that way you sound really scientific when you don't know what you're talking about. You could say, what does Everlimus do? It's an mTOR inhibitor. And what does an mTOR inhibitor do? It inhibits mTOR, right? So anyway, generations of graduate students and scientists and people were researching. It turned out to be part of an important signaling pathway that uh, Nina showed us earlier. And this is something which has turned out to be a very valuable targeted biologic drug. And the early studies that were done, we did with neuroendocrine cancer. The first one being radiant 3, which you saw, Everlimus versus placebo, turned out to be a positive trial. OK, with the upper line being progression-free time of 11.4 months with Everlimus versus 5.4 months with placebo. Then a study was done with lung and gastrointestinal, and it turned out the results were just the same. Right around the same time, targets were designed against the uh, blood vessels of the cancer. The, this is a picture of blood vessels in a cancer. It doesn't look anything like normal blood vessels. It's really um, extraordinary. And these are the blood vessels that get targeted by anti-angiogenics, um, like you were hearing about. So it turns out that the most important anti-angiogenic trial was with sunitinib, sutent, and this drug gave results that were virtually superimposable with Everolimus and, again, was highly effective. Now, we have a drug which we're hoping is going to be better than, than Sutent and Sunitinib, and that's a drug which inhibits not only that vascular endothelial growth factor, VEGF, but also inhibits another thing that makes neuroendocrine cells grow called MET. And this is called cabozantinib, and I have a lot of experience with this. And it's extremely, extremely active. The, the large national trial was based on an early trial that was done by Dr. Chan at uh, Dana-Farber. And in this small group of patients that were treated, intestinal carcinoids had a progression-free survival of 31.4 months, which is not a direct comparison with Sutent. But you remember the sunitinib data I just showed you was 11 months. And this is 31 months. It's looking really exciting. and. The, with um, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, uh, 22 months. So because of that, a large randomized trial is being undertaken right now, and we have, uh, await the results, but I'm very, very optimistic about this trial based on what I've seen so far, and I think it's something to think seriously about. The uh, study of um, telotristat in treating carcinoid syndrome very important study, which you've just heard about. 5-HIA goes down with telotristat dramatically, and with uh, higher doses even than what was approved, it can go down even more. So how do we make a decision about what to do? OK? Well, here's the way we do it. We first think, is the tumor localized or is it metastatic? If it's localized, surgery is where you go unless there's a really, really strong reason why somebody couldn't withstand surgery, surgery is the way to go. If you have metastatic disease, surgery is, is always a consideration. It's always part of the picture. It, it might or might not happen in the beginning. It might happen later. It just depends on circumstances. Everybody has to talk to everybody. But surgery is clearly a potentially curative treatment if it's localized. Is the tumor confined to liver? Or is it metastatic all over? If it's metastatic all over, you need an all over treatment. If it's localized in the liver, you could treat with various kinds of hepatic artery embolization, resection, ablation, all different things could be done on the liver. If it's widely metastatic, those options become not so attractive. You have to remember pathology 
needs to be reviewed by an expert pathologist. I can't emphasize that enough. I know it was emphasized a few times yesterday. You have to have a clear diagnosis. If it's G3, poorly differentiated, is it well differentiated um, G3, or is it poorly differentiated G3? How high is the proliferation rate? The pace of growth on imaging is critical. If the pathologist tells you it's low grade and the cancer is growing like crazy over a couple of months, the pathology is wrong. You have a sample error. Some area might have really looked like it was low grade and the pathologist had to call it like it is. But if you biopsied another piece, you might find it was not that low grade tumor after all. You don't want to be lulled into complacency because of what is happening. So you always have to use your head in medicine, okay? The primary site, pancreas is uniquely sensitive to chemotherapy, as um, Nina was telling us, and in um, the other sites where chemotherapy is not so good, we have to rely almost entirely on various kinds of targeted biologics, okay? And the next thing is how urgent is it to treat? Are you symptomatic from your tumor mass? Do you have symptoms of compromised function of a vital organ? Is your intestine obstructed? Is your ureter obstructed? Things like that. Are you having symptoms related to a tumor mass? And is the tumor functional or non-functional? Functional means it's making hormones. Do you have carcinoid syndrome? Are you at risk of carcinoid heart disease? Do you have a tumor making insulin or glucagon or gastrin or some other hormone which is causing serious problems and needs immediate attention? Or do you have a tumor which is not making any of those things and you don't have those issues? All of this needs to be put together. So after all the high-tech science, molecular um, uh, targeting, molecular imaging, DNA sequencing, and everything that you've heard about so far and will hear about, the one thing I want to leave you with, and the most important thing, is not the details of all of these trials, because what's a trial today will either be an approved medicine or be in the wastebasket of history in 10 years, one of the two, and there'll be a new generation of trials. What's really important is you don't forget the wisdom of ancient India, okay? You probably have heard the story about the 10 brilliant philosophers who were all blind and were trying to determine the nature of what is an elephant and what do you do with an elephant? And the one, um, you know, feeling the side thought it was a wall and one felt it was a, a snake when he was holding the tail and one thought it was a hose when he was holding the trunk and so on and each of these 10 wise men had a completely different view, and it wasn't until they all sat down together and talked to each other that they were able to figure out what was going on. The great 19th century poet uh, John Godfrey Sachs wrote, and so these men of Hindustan disputed loud and long, each in his own opinion exceeding stiff and strong, though each was partly in the right and all were in the wrong. You can't get anywhere unless <laughs> you sit down and talk. Now, instead of the elephant in the room, we have a zebra in the room. So look in the middle there and you'll see the zebra. And instead of 10 blind philosophers, you have 10 doctors, 10 different specialists, each one partially blind to the full capabilities of the other specialties. And none of these people sitting by themselves can possibly figure out the nature of the problem and what to do about it. And that's why we have a weekly tumor board. Every single week we have um, 20 plus doctors who come to this from all the major specialties who are leaders in the field and we talk about maybe a dozen patients every single week that are newly diagnosed that have problems in management that whatever and each one with its critical contribution and we all sit together the medical oncologist familiar with all the um, treatments for the body the surgeon familiar with all the surgical options nuclear medicine with diagnosis um, with scans and imaging and uh, PRRT therapy, and diagnostic radiology, expert in reading MRI and CT scans, and other kinds of specialized imaging, enterography, and other things that we do, a neuroendocrine pathologist, gastroenterologists who are experienced in advanced endoscopy with endoscopic ultrasound, double balloon push enteroscopy, and other advanced endoscopic techniques, cardiologists who are familiar with carcinoid heart disease and when and how to act when you have problems with carcinoid heart disease, radiation oncology for stereotactic body radiation, endocrinology, experts in all the different hormones, and the synergy that comes from such a combination is unbelievable. When you look at all the pathology together, you discuss the history together, you see all the x-rays together as a group, it's a very powerful experience and leads to, um, I think, 
great improvements in planning the right treatment for the right patient at the right time. Thank you.